Euh, bonjour, euh, je m'appelle Grace Johnson et aujourd'hui je parlais de abeilles et réactives. Oui, abeilles. Mais mon français est mauvais et, cette, et donc cette présentation sera en anglais. That's my attempt to at my French. I'm really sorry, but that's the best I can do. Thanks. So yeah, today I'm going to be presenting about bees and reactive. Might sound strange, but I come from a biology degree, so I tend to link everything I see in my technology sphere to reactive analogies that I, to, sorry, biological analogies that I understand. So my name is Grace Jansen. I work at IBM, see the pun, and I work in the UK as a developer advocate. So I go around to conferences, I make demos and tutorials around reactive. So, reactive architecture. So I'm going to be explaining why I think reactive application architecture is the future of uh, application architecture. And it's been mentioned a lot throughout the conference so far. So Clement has mentioned it. If you are in Hugh's talk earlier, he also mentioned it. Reactive messaging has been um, talked about a lot at this conference as well. So hopefully you guys have got a solid grounding now in the principles of reactive. Oh, turn this on would be helpful. There we go. So, the evolution of software. So this was, it's been mentioned a lot in this conference. We've gone from monolithic applications to microservices. And that was a great step forward. When we had these monolithic applications, they were getting so large, they became these huge, monstrous things that were hard to debug, hard to introduce new features to. So moving to a microservice architecture made a lot of sense. And it's enabled us to have a lot of benefits. But there are still issues. There are still issues around having, um, being able to respond to load changes in your system, having reactive applications that react instantaneously to actions that are performed upon it, and being able to be elastic and have um, elastic resource allocation to make sure you have the most efficient use of your resources. So how do we enable this? How do we go from this microservice? Where do we go to? So I looked to nature as inspiration for this, and I looked to bees. So bees are this amazing system where they're made up of individuals, um, but they work towards this greater good of the hive. So they have this greater mission of making sure the hive is successful. So even though each individual is an individual in its own right, they all work towards this common goal. And bees have been evolving into this system for millennia. They've had this evolution process, which has been a deliberate process to get to this stage. So I'm going to show you three bee behaviors that we want to be able to mimic in our applications. So bees have this, enable, uh, this ability to perform different roles. So in a beehive, there are tons of different roles. You can be a, a bee that creates the beehive. You can be a worker bee, where you're either a caretaker bee, or a nurse bee, or even an undertaker bee, getting rid of the dead bees. So there are tons of different roles, and one of those is a scalp bee. So the role of the scalp bee is they go out and they try and find food. They try and find flowers for the other bees to be able to go to to collect the nectar that they need. So when a bee, a scout bee, goes out and finds a successful flower, they come back and they make their way to these dedicated dance floors. So they literally have a dedicated area in the hive that they come to dance. So when they get back, they basically wiggle their butts around to be able to communicate with the other bees, the listener bees, around this dance floor where the flower is, how much pollen there is, uh, how far away it is, how much energy it will take to get there. They can even factor in wind speeds to factor in how long it will take for the bees to get there. So the really important part about this is that these listener bees have to react as quickly as possible to the information they're being fed from the dancer bees. If they don't react as quickly as possible, another beehive could beat them to that flower, drain off those important resources, and those bees would be left about without food. So it's super important that these bees are as quick as possible. So bees have to be extremely responsive. The second example I'm going to show is, OK, what happens to a beehive when the queen bee dies? So the queen bee is the one in the hive who makes all the new baby bees. And without the queen bee, the hive just won't continue. Bees don't really last that long. They don't have as long a lifespan as we do. So they constantly need new bees in the system. So what happens in the potentially catastrophic situation that the bee queen dies, one of pretty much the most important member of the hive? Well, bees don't panic. They don't shut down. The hive doesn't crash. Instead, they carry on because they know that there are they have an innate trust in the system that instructions will be put in place to replace the queen. So there are nurser bees that pick up on the pheromone signals, so the chemical signals that the queen produces when she's alive. 
So when the queen dies, those pheromone signals disappear or gradually decrease, and they're able to put in motion a series of steps that enable them to create a new queen bee. So they pick about four or five pupae, they feed them royal jelly, and the first one that pops out becomes the queen. Brutally, she then murders the others, but it's a necessary act to be able to carry on with the hive. So in the space of about a month, they've been able to basically get rid of this potentially catastrophic situation and carry on as normal with the hive. The rest of the bees are able to carry on and the hive continues regardless that one of the most important members of their system has died or gone down. So the third situation, bees at war. So what I said about the, the different roles, one of those roles is a guard role. Their job is to protect the hive at all costs. But normally, only about 11% of the hive are actually guard bees. So what happens when something bigger than this worm comes to attack the hive? Let's say a bear. 11% of the hive just isn't going to cut it. So instead, the guard bees come back into the hive and recruit some of the other bees in different roles to come and be guard bees. So they're able to elastically change their roles depending on the load strains to the system. So for bears coming at it, they can rapidly increase the number of guards by elastically um, changing their roles dynamically. That's exactly what we want from our applications, right? We want our applications to be able to change um, what, which services are dedicated to depending on the loads on our systems. So I'm not just rambling on about bees. How does this relate to software? So each of the behaviors I described actually really like maps really well to the different cornerstones of the reactive manifesto. So you might have seen this in Clement's talk earlier. So let's have a look through them. So the first one is responsive. So as I showed you with the bees dancing, it's super important that those bees are as responsive as possible. That's exactly what we want from our applications. I don't want to be a user sat at my computer clicking away continuously because I don't know if anything's happening. I don't know if my response or the event that I've tried to create is going through that system. So it's really important that we create applications that respond to the events that our users are creating. The second example I gave was around the, the elasticity of our systems. So the, the elastic nature of the role changing of bees. So the fact that bees are able to dynamically change roles depending on that load is exactly what we want from our systems. Let's say I've got a restaurant app and I've got a certain amount of services dedicated to booking a table and a certain amount of services dedicated to paying for my table. So if I've got hardly anyone paying, but I've got tons of people flooding my system trying to book or reserve a table, well, it makes sense for me to migrate my resources to that service in order to create a better allocation of my resources for more efficient um, and cost-efficient usage. The last cornerstone is resiliency. So as I said with the... Um, the fact that when a queen bee dies, the hive doesn't shut down, the hive doesn't crash, nothing bad goes on, they just have an innate trust in the system that a new version of that queen will be brought up, just like we want in applications. If one of my services goes down within my application, my, my application shouldn't crash. It's 2019, people don't expect applications to go down just because a small subset went down or crashed or isn't working. So we need our applications to be resilient so that they perform regardless of what's going on within our application. And this is all underpinned by messages. So bees do it in exactly the same way. So bees have message systems, so either through chemical signals, so the pheromones that I mentioned, or through the dances that they do between each other. Through these messages, they're able to communicate both on a one-to-one -one basis and on a one-to-many. The one-to-many example is the dancer that I showed you. That one dancer is able to communicate the same amount of information to all of the listener bees all at once, asynchronously, importantly. They don't have to wait for that response from the other bees to say, yeah, I got that information, thanks, I'll head there. They just know that they're going to head there and they know that that action is going to be taken. So these seem to kind of solve the problems I was mentioning. So we seem to be tackling the issues that I mentioned around the fact that we need our applications to be responsive, elastic, and resilient. So perhaps reactive architecture is something to be considering when you're looking at the future of your application architecture. Now, has anyone here heard of reactive programming before? I'm going to expect a lot of hands. Yeah, fantastic. So what's the difference between reactive programming and reactive systems? This was, again, mentioned in Clement's talk. So if you imagine, there's an article written by Jonas Bonner. So if you imagine, he's the guy who basically um, helped to write the reactive manifesto and start this whole movement. 
So Jonas Spinner basically said in this article, imagine reactive programming as a team of football players. So anyone support football here? A few nods, a few hands. Great, so you'll understand this analogy. So imagine you've got a team full of messies. He's a pretty good player. Uh, we'll just all go with that assumption in case people argue. But he's a pretty good player in his own right. Okay, so this individual might be the best tackler. He might be the best scorer. He might be the best at dribbling that ball up the pitch. But when you stick him in a team of other messies, They've never played together. They don't have set plays. They don't have an innate trust that they know what the others will do and they know how the others will react to things that they're doing. So you've got this issue of, okay, you've got individually great players. You've got individually reactive components. But as a system, they don't necessarily work that well together. Now let's take a look at the other side. Imagine you've got a team of players who've been playing together for 25 years. They're not Lionel Messi. They're about middle of the table but they know each other's plays, right? They've got this innate sense and trust that they know how to react to how the others are gonna play. Now imagine you combine these two. Imagine you've got a team of Lionel Messi's who've been playing together for 25 years. You've got the ultimate team. You've got people who, can, who are individually amazing at tackling or passing or scoring, but who are able to have that reactivity and that trust between the components as well. So reactive systems is a great way of combining these two. So we combine reactive programming as a tool to use when we're designing reactive systems. So reactive programming is great, but only using reactive programming will not give you a reactive system. It's only by combining the two that you can really become reactive and non-blocking. So how do we enable these reactive behaviors? Another pun for you all. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> So how do we enable these reactive behaviors? Well, I'm gonna take you through a couple of the uh, common toolkits and methodologies we use when we're designing reactive systems. This is not an exhaustive list. I'm not including all of them because we'd be here all day and we want to go home. So I'm only gonna include a few. So domain-driven design, hands up if you've heard of it. Great, fantastic, so I don't have to spend too long on this one. So domain-driven design, so you're talking about a domain. Usually we break it down into business domains. A domain can be used in general for a sphere of knowledge though. So it's really up to you how you break down your application. But by breaking them down into those domains, you can have ubiquitous language within them so that they can communicate very effectively. So driven design just basically means we're driving the design of our application based on those domains, so those spheres of knowledge. So if we take the B example, breaking it down, so imagine this is my monolithic application. Breaking it down into the microservices, into the different domains, we've got three different domains in the bee society. So you start as a baby bee, and there is one of three things you can become. You can either become a drone bee, so they're the males who basically just mate and then die, or you become a queen bee. There, that's, uh, there can only be one queen bee in a hive. The queen bees are the ones that mate with the drones and then make the babies. Or you can become a worker bee. That's when it gets interesting. So worker bees are the ones that then split into the multiple different roles. So the worker bee is actually our aggregate root of that business domain. So those worker bees have that ubiquitous language because they can actually switch roles between the different roles that they can become. They can switch from a caretaker to a nurse, from a nurse to a guard pretty easily. But what happens when we're trying to communicate between these business designs, so between these microservices? Well, it's already been mentioned in previous other talks, but you need asynchronous communication. If you don't have asynchronous communication, you're gonna get blocking and you're not gonna become a reactive application. So communication between microservices needs to be asynchronous. This is the really important part. It's really important to decouple these services from each other so you don't have dependency. So if one goes down, the other isn't brought down with it. That was mentioned to anyone in Hugh's talk earlier when he showed the diagram of the different boxes. So we don't want that situation to occur. So it's really important that we decouple these services and their dependencies. And this is important right now because we've moved, as Clement mentioned, we've moved from a data at rest scenario to a data in motion. So when we first started building applications, it was okay if we did overnight batch processing, right? It was okay for it to take a while for our data to update. Nowadays, that's not okay anymore. We need to, to be reacting to data as it comes in, as it's created, as the events are propagated. So it's really important that we react to this data in motion form of architecture. And to do that, a really common approach is to use event sourcing. 
So did anyone go to some of the event sourcing talks today? Yeah, a few nods. So event sourcing is basically, um, it enables you to store a sequence of events that happen to the state of the application. So when the state changes, you record that as an event in your event log. It's often combined with CQRS in Reactive. So CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and it basically means that you're separating your read and write databases. Um, and bees already do this when you think about it. So as Hugh mentioned, in microservices, it's really important that we decouple the database. So each microservice has their own store, be it through a database or be it through a, um, a, like a schema. It's really important that they have their own version of the state of the application in order to completely decouple them. And so if you imagine in bees, bees already do that because bees have a brain. So you can imagine the brain is basically their version of the state of their system, of their world. So when this dancer bee comes along, you can imagine the dancer bee is basically the writing to the read databases of the listener bees. And the great thing about having their own version of, of the state of the application or the state of the system is that enables high availability. So this was mentioned in Rudy's talk earlier about the cap theorem. Has everyone heard of the cap theorem? Yeah, a few hands, great. So the cap theorem is this, um, if you weren't in Rudy's talk, it's around uh, three different characteristics, and the point is you can never have all three. So most systems, as Rudy explained, choose availability over consistency. And that's actually how we work in the real world. It's, it's most similar to how we work in reality. If I told you something, it would take a while for your friends to find out. We have eventual consistency, and so building our applications around that model kind of makes sense. So with the bees, for example, they have high availability and eventual consistency. So when my bee gets told, oh yeah, there's a flower over there and starts flying off, they have high availability because if a bit of wind knocks it off path, for example, it's able to re-look at where that flower was based on the state that it had in its head and re-find like find the path, find the right path to get to that flower again. But what happens when the last bee that went to that flower discovers there's no more food left? Well, that bee that started heading towards that flower has no idea. It's not consistent with the state of the application. So although the listener bees that are back at the hive are now updated, the bees that have already flown off to that flower are not consistent. They haven't been updated with that new event in the, in the state of the system. So instead, they're eventually consistent. But that's OK. It's only a couple of bees. Um, and the fact that you get high availability is a more beneficial characteristic of this type of application. But there are things that you can do to try and improve the consistency. So for example, uh, database sharding. So database sharding, there are different forms of sharding. So you might have heard of ACA sharding before. That's something different to what I'm describing. So I'm describing database sharding. So it's basically a form of partitioning your database. Um, so it's a way of separating out very large databases into smaller, fast, and more manageable parts, basically called a shard. A shard is just a small part of a whole. So it's meant to make very large databases more manageable. So if we imagine, and it also helps create greater parallelism um, without collisions in the database. So if we imagine the bees, let's assume they're not able to do this. Let's assume instead of having a hive with the classic honeycomb structure that we all know and love, instead they've got one massive vat that they stick all of the honey in. But in order to stick the honey in that they collect, they have to do it on a one by one basis. So they start forming this queue of bees, and you get all of these wasted resources. These bees are stuck in this queue, basically, waiting for the bee in front of them to deliver their honey. So you've got all these wasted resources that you could have been using had you just split up the hive so that they could go to individual cells rather than all queuing for the same cell. It's the same in databases. If we can access different parts of the database all at the same time, it means we can have this greater parallelism uh, without the collision of data and it enables us to reduce the number of wasted resources we have in the system. Another resource we use is uh, back pressure. So back pressure is a form of flow control or feedback, um, and it basically means that it's to prevent the system from becoming unstable um, or failing. So it's designed to basically stop bottlenecks. So if we imagine it in the sense of the bee example that I gave, so let's imagine you've got a stream of bees coming in with the honey, trying to stick their honey in the different honeycomb cells. But you've run out of cells. So let's say that the, uh, the bees that make the cells aren't catching up quick enough. Instead, what we should be doing, instead of them piling up and realizing and it being too late, 
Instead, before they run out of cells, maybe it would be a good idea for them to communicate that they're struggling with that workload. So back pressure is basically when the subscribers to events can't keep up with the publishers. So it's a form of feedback from those subscribers to say, whoa, slow down, I'm not coping, please go slower. And, we can, and bees do that. So what bees can do is these hive-making bees can communicate back with the scalp bees and say, yo, can, can a couple of you come and help us, please? Can you switch roles and come and help us build more hive cells? And that way, they're able to keep up with the demand of the honey coming in. And that's what exactly what we want from our applications. We need this feedback to stop these wasted resources and to stop the blocking in our system. Oh, there we go. Bulk heading is another tool that we commonly use in this industry. So bulk heading, I kind of like to think of it as the opposite. So this is kind of like when the subscribers um, are told by the publishers how fast to go. So, sorry, when the publishers are told by the subscribers. So basically, the publisher in this case um, is controlling how many bees go to the flower. So if the publisher is the dancer bee and the listener bees are the subscribers, the publisher determines how many bees should go to that hive to that flower, sorry, by communicating how rich a food source that is. So in this case, is the publishers determining the rate of flow of events going through the system. And it's essentially to protect limited resources. Um, so in this case, the, both the bees and the flower are limited resources that we don't want to be used up or to become inefficient. And so to stop them from being exhausted, we protect them by only sending a certain number of bees, because if we sent too many and they came back empty-handed, that would be a bit of a wasted journey. So. Lastly, we're talking about circuit breaking. So circuit breaking, in this case, the example is kind of loosely related because you've got to remember that bees are intelligent beings, right? They have a brain and they can analyze their own behavior. Software doesn't yet. So it's a little bit loose, but bear with me. So in the example of bees, bees are actually able to self-diagnose when they're sick or when they're not performing to their full capability. So what they do is they remove themselves from the hive in order to give themselves a break to try and recover. If they recover, which hopefully they do, they can then re-enter the hive and join right where they left off. So go back to their original role and join in and help with the hive again. With software, when we're using it in reactive, often you'll have like a parent microservice or a parent actor looking at child actors or child microservices to analyze how well they're coping. By looking at the error messages coming out of those actors or those microservices, you can analyze whether a certain error is popping up again and again, or whether a microservice isn't performing to its full capability. And when you realize that, you can then implement circuit breakers to try and give that microservice or that service a rest in order to recover and work through the workload that it's got queued up. So by introducing circuit breakers, we can basically, again, help to protect limited or um, resources that are under extreme stress in order to make sure our system performs to the best of its ability. So they're just some of the different tools that we use. Again, like I said, it's not an exhaustive list. Um, there are many more resources and tools out there that you can use, some of which were mentioned in Clement's talk, some of which were mentioned in Hugh's talk. So if you didn't catch those, do go back and have a look at them, because there are some really great pieces of information in there. So what do you do if you want to implement Reactive? Well, you can actually implement all of the, all of the techniques I mentioned by scratch if you want to, or you can take the easier approach and use the free open source frameworks that are out there. So there are loads of different frameworks that you can choose from. So Acker, Play, and Legom are three frameworks by a company called Lightbend. So Hugh works at Lightbend. Um, and so Acker is for like making actor-based micro microservices. Legom is their opinionated microservice framework. And Play is more for the web framework side of things. You've then got Vertex. So Vertex has been created by Red Hat, um, and that works in conjunction with uh, Quarkus, for example. And then you've got MicroProfile. So has anyone heard of MicroProfile? A few hands, yeah. So in MicroProfile, they've introduced the reactive messaging and reactive streams implementations. So you can use those to implement in your reactive systems. And then you've got Spring Reactor, if you use Spring, or RxJava, which was created by Netflix and is now an open source project as well. So these are all open source, they're all free, um, so if you do want to have a go, um, there are tons of blogs and tutorials out there on how to get started on any of these frameworks. But why do you even care? Right? Why am I up here talking to you about this? What impact is it going to have on your business or your application? So I've got a real world example from a company called Verizon. So has anyone heard of Verizon before? Yep, so a phone company, mainly based out in the USA. They actually switched from a monolithic application to a microservices reactive-based application. 
So they came to us and they said, look, we've got two and a half billion interactions a year, most of which is happening through our digital channels. And in fact, almost half is happening on our mobile channels. But they had massive issues. So when it came to, let's say, Black Friday, or the new release of an iPhone, for example, or the, the brand new Huawei, they had issues with keeping their services up and running, essentially. So when these, when these massive load increases happened on their system because of these sales or these events, they had to actually shut down parts of their website in order to deal with this mass influx of users trying to buy the new phone, which is just ridiculous in the modern society. And so they came to us and said, look, how can we deal with these increased loads but still keep the rest of our application running? And so with the, w combining IBM and Lightbend, we created them a microservice reactive system um, that basically came up with these benefits. So once they switched, their conversion rate actually went up by 1.6%. Not only that, but their page response time improved. They also got to use an eighth of the infrastructure that they were previously using, so a huge decrease in the costs associated with that infrastructure. And they also had a deployment time improvement from four to eight hours, which is huge, to 30 minutes. Now, bear in mind that some of that is going to be because they moved from monolithic to microservice, but some of it is because they moved from microservice to reactive. Not only that, but importantly, it wasn't just the customers that benefited. The developers actually became more productive on average. So they improved their productivity by 20 to 40%. So that's money improved for the company, but it's also happier employees. And then they also improved their order completion time from 41 minutes to 27. So you can see that they had massive benefits from switching from a monolithic to a reactive microservice-based application. Why do you care about this anyway? How's it going to have an impact on your business, and why should you switch to reactive? Well, if you care about any of the things in the reactive manifesto, then maybe reactive is something you should be looking at. If you care if your application remains responsive under increased load, if you care about the cost-efficient use of your resources and elastically scaling that um, based on the load to your system, and if you care about being a resilient system that it always works for your app for your users, then maybe reactive is the way that you should be looking. And perhaps it's something you should be investigating for the future of your application architecture. So what can you do to be able to make this change and migrate from monolithic or microservices to reactive? As I said before, there are tons of resources online. Um, so we have a few on IBM. So we've got some blogs and tutorials. There's a really good course by Lightbend on Coursera. Uh, but there's also other, other sources you can use. I'm just listing some of the ones we've got on IBM. We've got a really great blog, so if you've, it's like a blog series. So if you're currently using a, micro, a monolithic application and you're not quite sure how to break it down, or you're not quite sure how to turn your microservices into a more reactive system, we've got a blog that basically takes you through from step zero, so breaking down that monolithic application, all the way through to breaking down into microservices and then implementing the different tools to become a completely reactive system, all the way through from database all the way up to your front end. So that's a really useful blog if you, um, if you want to follow that progress all the way through. Here's some more links um, to some more useful tools and blogs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you are short for time and my talk hasn't persuaded you, or all of the other talks around Reactive in this conference haven't persuaded you to switch to Reactive, there is a why you should switch in less than 12 minutes. So if you only have 12 minutes, please visit that blog and check out why you should be switching. I've also linked to a few of the other um, the frameworks that I mentioned, so Acker and Legom, Vertex is on there. There's some stuff around the Reactive Manifesto. So if you didn't learn enough in Clement or Mine's talk and it's still not clear, please do visit their website. Um, there's a whole website describing why they created the manifesto um, and the different aspects of it explaining, and there's a glossary of terms if you struggle with any of the terms mentioned. Um, and there's a couple of other blogs as to why you should switch to Reactive. So thanks, I finished a bit early, but if you guys have any questions, please do let me know. But I hope I persuaded you to switch, because if bees can do it, then we can do it. Thanks.